Whenever something gets popular, there's always some that want to take a magnifying glass and really dig out anything they can to discredit it usually for their own benefit. Why were turtles the number one enemy of the Canadian meat industry? Why was playing 80s tabletop RPGs the same as satanic rituals? Or comic books the reason for most juvenile delinquency? The controversy addressed by protest groups would gain media attention and often ended a line or at least result into household bans. In this Ed's Retro Geek Out, we take a look at a couple moments in history where some of our favorite toy lines had a really hard time with the Mad Mom Mob press. Be sure to subscribe for more toy history videos and let's strap in for a controversial toy history. At the end of the 80s, the Ninja Turtles toy line popped up and soon reached the top. With Turtle Mania came the cartoons, live action movies, and next to the comics they had found their origin in, also books. Books that would show how responsible they were, you know, being a good role model for kids. Keeping them away from the dangers of substance abuse in the children's book TMNT, Don't Do Drugs, a rap song. An exuberant and bouncy rap song style text gets to the heart of the matter. That it's not easy to say no, but you need to do it. Although this one didn't really get in trouble, is the other one also released by Random House that did. With the ABCs for a better planet, the turtles were on their way to clean up the planet, together with Toxic Crusaders and Captain Planet, they were in on the eco craze of the early 90s. Each page in this 1991 book is a different letter of the alphabet teaching something about the environment and how to save the planet. So why was this such a controversial book? Pressing matters like acid rain, recycling rubbish, Pesticides, fast food are discussed and are still issues we look at today, but it was the letter M which stood for meat and didn't rub well for the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, saying the book was an unfair attack on the beef industry. They wanted the book altered or taken off store shelves as it wasn't well researched and would influence kids into not wanting meat. As it talks about the grain the cattle eats that could be used to help starvation and kids themselves should eat less meat as some of it is injected with artificial hormones. All this in a kid's book? Really? Now, the publisher didn't seem to give a cow and came back with not seeing what kind of harm a five-year-old could do to the cattle industry. But TMNT would also have books written about them, exposing them for what they truly are. In 1991, Joan Hake Roby would see her 78-page manifest published to explain why Ninja Turtles sends kids the wrong message about violence and all other facets of life and religion. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Exposed, a critical analysis, is a real trip on how when you look at something hard enough and long enough, you can write pretty much whatever. She sets out to inform you about turtles, but does so by taking everything seriously and too far-fetched. Turning these crime-fighting heroes into the bad part of history ninjutsu warriors are known for, and attaching overindulged statements about Splinter being like a father and connecting him as a giant rat savior whom kids would look to as God. Them proceeding to say, well isn't this blasphemy? In the Archie comics, April O'Neil is too voluptuous and sexy. She has skirts that are too short revealing almost the top of her thigh. A gorgeous creature! Now our seven year old's already looking at that, and what if they were? She plants loose ideas in a word association manner or game. Take for instance this segment, Darkness, which she connects to the 1990 movie, which does take place in a lot of darkness, where night action occurs. Children are afraid of the dark, she then goes to mention, and many evil deeds are done in darkness. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So therefore, any movie with darkness is evil. Now I don't know what she was on when she wrote this book. Maybe she should have read the TMNT Don't Do Drugs book. And this also goes for the other books on Timely Books, the publisher of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Exposed. In the one about Dungeons and Dragons, the truth about Dungeons and Dragons, they actually claim that the spells within the games are real. What? No match for good. Today, Dungeons and Dragons or D&D is popular and accepted in pop culture, but during the 80s, it would often get linked to Satanism and self-harm. 
first published in 1974 by Tactical Studies Rules or TSR. The game is based on miniature war games that preceded it, but would have a Wizards and Monsters team in them. A dungeon master guides all the players through imaginary adventures within this fantasy world. Acting as a referee, he or she oversees the players earning experience points, making them work together to advance in the game. Nowadays, we all have the D&D dice and have pretty epic representations of the game boards and miniatures. But back then, all you needed was some construction paper, pawns, and a lot of imagination. It must have looked weird, perhaps, seeing kids getting together and reading from these books, depicting demons on the front covers, and investing so much time and dedication into these sessions that could last a day. Or maybe these kids were just having fun. To perpetuate the fun, the D&D books would go through many changes to keep the game interesting, but also due to lawsuits as they based their characters loosely off of Greek mythology, well-known fantasy characters that looked a lot like they came straight out of Lord of the Rings or from H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythology. With the threat of copyright actions, they altered the names and revised the books, but there would also be a set of events which turned the fantasy of the game into a real medieval witch hunt, with RPG book burnings by Christian groups who saw the game as real devil worship, witchcraft, and took offense to the nudity in some of the art. They also linked it to murder and suicide. The moral panic would have parents keeping their kids away from the game as it represented these players as associated with the occult. Tom Hanks would play in a 1982 movie based on the novel Mazes and Monsters, which was based on the 1979 case of the disappearance of James Egbert, who was a 16-year-old at the time and struggling to fit in, deciding to end his life in 1980. James was a D&D player and the media and protest groups connected the two like a combiner Decepticon, putting the whole D&D experience in a bad daylight. They said it was due to him getting lost in the game's fantasy that he suffered a mental breakdown and so everything could be blamed on D&D. Maybe they should have just looked into his depression. Some mothers even formed a protest group called BADD. Yeah, bad or bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. The co-creator Gary Gygax ended up having to hire a bodyguard because he was receiving death threats. But in the end, all it really did was expose the game to a lot more players, as TSR reported selling over $60 million in rulebook sales at the end of 82. The pursuit of any toys hinting to the occult would continue and they would get their share of critique from Christian protest groups. I remember years ago looking for a toy documentary on YouTube and stumbling on this one video that just just blew my mind. While watching it, I entered a realm of satanic panic lobbying pastors and authors as they promoted their thoughts in this video called Deception of a Generation. A talk show led by Dr. Gary Greenwald, a pastor who brings light to all sorts of things that can corrupt kids and make them join the dark side. Guesting was no one other than Phil Phillips. Gary Greenwald, Phil Phillips, these sound like names made up by Stan Lee so he could remember the characters more easily. Anyways, you guessed it. Phil Phillips wrote a book called Turmoil in the Toy Box. He explains that on one of his spiritual walks, he somehow found himself inside of a toy store and couldn't believe his eyes. What he saw was being sold to kids. The fact that he ran into a kid that said He-Man has more power than Jesus, he is the most powerful man in the universe, confused the hell out of him as well. He knew that only God was master of the universe. Out in the parking lot with He-Man in his hand, running around in circles. Anyways, he started investigating all the occult symbolism in pop culture, and together with Gary Greenwald, they would tag team themselves through the whole Saturday morning lineup. They actually thought these shows and toys which they somehow bought to play with on the show were Satan's vessels, and they weren't taking any prisoners. Every IP got the full treatment than this comedic roast. I break every stronghold and I command that Satan lose his hold upon your household. Thundercats were heathen gods. E.T.'s resurrection could confuse the alien with Christian figures who had done the same. Even the Smurfs were bad. The characters are blue with black lips, so they're dead zombie-like creatures. Of course, Dungeons and Dragons had to make its appearance because that cartoon was like a crash course in spell and witchcraft. Skeletor, the master of the universe. Now hold on Gary, you're about to summon a demon. Heck, even Rainbow Bright wasn't saved because she had a pentagram on her cheek. Scooby-Doo, Cookie Crisps, even glow-in-the-dark toys are occultic. Well, okay, they were demon-shaped glow-in-the-dark toys. And after viewing the VHS, you could also buy the interview and others on cassette tape. What's next, Gary? Action figures? 
During the 50s, it was the book Seduction of the Innocent that would have the whole comic book industry under fire. Frederick Wortham was a psychiatrist that wrote this minor bestseller, warning everyone that comic books had negative effects on kids and were a serious cause of juvenile delinquency. He looked at inmates on how all they ever read were comics and so connected the two, but this was no scientific study. He lacked sample size and substance in his research. This cry for panic created an alarm for any parents who had their kids reading any comics. Sure, there were even creepy EC comics and even crime comics out on the shelves, but they ended up charging any comic book form, so much that the Comics Code Authority was established by the publishers themselves. They'd send in their new issues to get revised and approved with the Comics Code Authority seal of approval, so parents knew there wasn't any harm in having their kids read these. Now, EC Comics had some of the most gruesome covers and stories and got the worst of the court case. In the end, EC Comics didn't even want to join the Comics Authority Code and ended up having to close down the classics like Tales from the Crypt or The Fall of the Horror. Lots of comic books leading up to the events of this trial would end up getting destroyed, making them more rare and valuable on the aftermarket, as not as many were left anymore. Now, this episode was a way broader take on events that could have jeopardized toy lines. In the end, it didn't ban any toys, but it seriously shook the whole toy industry, making them alter and change around things in cartoons and the toys themselves. This wasn't about a toy malfunctioning or containing something toxic, getting it off store shelves, but the interpretation and assumption of the influence these IPs and stories would have on kids. That's why I did pop it under the banned, cancelled, and controversial toys banner. Some childhoods were really impacted by the spreading of these ideologies, all to protect the kids, but it seemed like some of the matters were taken too seriously word for word, or they just needed something to blame for very unfortunate events. Remember the time they tried suing Metal Act Judas Priest for so-called subliminal messages on their records? Now luckily, the verdict ended up positive for the band, but it's good that those taking Metal to court didn't get their hands on any Venom records before the hearing. Have you heard of any more of these crazy wacky stories? Then please leave them down in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe for more weekly toy videos and follow me on my socials. Please leave a like down below if you'd like to support the channel even more. You can always join the Patreon and get access to our exclusive of Patreon, Discord, where we talk toys all the time. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.